be finding 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, making our way through uh, this uh, wonderful, wonderful book in the New Testament. Paul's letter to a church there in Corinth who lived in a wicked society. They were planted right there at uh, we would think of it as planted right there at the very gates of hell. I mean, the culture was wicked. Uh, the people there in the culture were wicked. I mean, it was just a difficult place. And uh, we've said, as we've made our way through this study, that that's where the church ought to be, man. It ought to be right there in the middle where uh, things are, are, are dark and where things are ugly. And the church ought to be shining its light very, very brightly. And so Paul is writing to this church there in Corinth and uh, they had allowed somewhat of the world to get into the church. And so he's writing not only to encourage them, but he's also rebuking them and saying, look, there's some things, and we'll see more about that in chapter 5 as we begin next Sunday. But, but he, he rebukes them a little bit and said, you know, there's some things going on in the church uh, there's a large part that's reflecting the world instead of reflecting Jesus Christ. And so he begins to, to write to them, to challenge them and rebuke them as well as encourage them. So as, as we have made our way through the first four and a half chapters of this uh, book, we have seen Paul basically focus on the same problem. There seems to be as he writes in the first four chapters, uh, there seems to be conflict in the church. Now, why is Paul and us, why is Paul taking so much time on this subject? Well, I believe it's because the Bible takes so much time on this subject. The Bible takes time to deal with conflict in the church. You see, I'm of the firm conviction this morning that the Word of God speaks so forcefully on this subject because it is so important. Here's a statement that I want you to write down. You need to keep this in, the, uh, uh, in, in your notes or in the flyleaf of your Bible. Write this down. Division in the church always weakens our witness and tarnishes God's glory. Division in the church always weakens our witness and it tarnishes God's glory. Aren't you glad to be a part of a church that's in unity? Aren't you glad to be a member of a church that is in harmony? Well, our text today emphasizes, listen to this now, our text today emphasizes the core problem in almost all Every conflict situation. What is the core problem in, in situations of conflict, preacher? Pride. Pride. Arrogance. You know pride is the enemy of humility? Matter of fact, that is the title of our message today, if you're writing down, the enemy of humility. And the enemy of humility is pride. It's pride, listen to this, it is pride that leads us to view every issue as a contest that must be determined by a winner or a loser. That, that's what pride does. It, it is pride that leads us to conclude that we know better or that our experience is more significant or that our understanding is superior to everybody else's. You see, it is arrogance that concludes that the other guy's problem is pride. <laughs> huh? Say amen. amen. C.S. Lewis, listen to this, one of the greatest quotes on pride. He said this, and I quote, He said, There is one vice of which no man in the world is free which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they're guilty of themselves. The essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. End of quote. Wow. 
What a definition of pride and what a definition of arrogance in a person's life. There are only two points that, that I want you to see this morning and we're going to take it right out of the text. The main, the main uh, two points. First of all, I want you to write this down. Pride's delusion. Pride's delusion. Follow with me beginning in verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who makes thee to differ from another? And what is thou, listen to this, what is thou that thou did not receive? Now if thou did receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Now ye are full. Now ye are rich. You've reigned as kings without us. And I, I would to God ye did reign that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set for us the apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you're wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. That can be translated scum of the earth. and are the off-scouring of all things unto this day. That's what Paul points out as pride's delusion. Now, understand the context here. In the context of our scripture, uh, Paul begins by speaking sarcastically to the church at Corinth. If you just arbitrarily picked up uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and you started reading it, verse 8, it would be easy to miss what Paul was saying uh, and, and trying to communicate. Uh, basically, in verse 8, he says, Already you have all you want. Already you become rich. You become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might reign with you, so that we might be kings with you. Now, if you didn't know the context, you would probably assume that the church at Corinth was a, a just a super church made up of super Christians. But we would be wrong because we would be reading it out of context. In verse 7, he had challenged the church to adopt an attitude of humility. But in verse 8, he shows them how much they needed to change. They were too stinking arrogant. Amen. All of us know people like that, don't we? Yeah. Amen. Arrogant, prideful people. If you, if you have a hard time pointing one out, just go to the mirror. Amen? Amen. That person is the one with the bony finger constantly telling us how, how things really are. It's the supervisor who, who puts up a suggestion box, but he never reads the suggestions. The prideful person is the one-upper. You know what a one-upper is, don't you? For anything that you may tell, any, any accomplishment that you may have, they one-up you a little bit. They've done it a little bit better. They, they caught a little bit bigger one. That, I mean, that, their experience was just a, a little grander hard to be around those people sometimes. Amen. Come on now, don't be too spiritual this morning. I mean, we try to avoid them. We stay away from them. Sometimes when they uh, begin with that one-up story, we just kind of roll our eyes at, at the person standing beside us. <laughs> Even our culture encourages uh, and the attitude of arrogance and the uh, parade of pride, our culture encourages. Have, have you ever noticed how the media focuses on people who act like the world revolves around them? Now, I don't, I don't want you to do this because I've only done it on occasion, just bits and pieces. But if you, if, if you, just, turn on, if you just read magazines today, if you keep up with the Kardashians, okay? They think the world revolves around them. Yeah. And they've made an empire from doing nothing. Huh? <laughs> Say amen. amen. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Uh, but you don't just find those people in the culture. You find them in the church as well. Amen. I take a look at your life this morning. I, I take a look at my life this morning. Do I always have to be right? Are you argumentative? 
Do you think your way is the only way and your belief, now I'm talking about not an essential belief, but your belief in a certain area is the only correct one? Listen, here's the problem in my life sometimes, and I know none of y'all struggle with this, but I do. I am tempted to think of all the people that need a message like this. But it's funny. The person who needs it the most, most of the time, is me. But I seem to overlook that little issue. I don't want you to think this morning about all the people you think need to hear this message about pride. We need to take a hard look at our own lives. You know, the Bible says that pride precedes a fall. Now, notice the danger pride poses in our life according to the Apostle Paul. In verses 6 and 7, write this down. Pride makes us self-indulgent. Pride makes us self-indulgent. Look at verse uh, number 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against the, the other. For who makes thee to differ from another? And what have you, or, or and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, who dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. Now what's he saying here? He's saying this. He's saying if you're not careful, your pride will put the focus on the wrong person in your life. Paul has encouraged the Corinthians to remember that everything they have has been received as a gift from ultimately Almighty God. Amen. They were not part of God's family because of their intellect. They were not part of God's family because of their ability. They certainly weren't a part of God's family because of their conduct. No, they were God's children because of the Father's incredible gift. Think about this illustration, and, and sometimes this isn't a far stretch for some of us, but, but suppose you were invited. You, you were invited to speak at a dinner in, in honor of one of the people who works with you. Let's just say a co-worker. Would it be appropriate to get up and tell stories about your life and recount your accomplishments? Not to single anybody out, but once again, and, and I know I'm, th I'm doing exactly what I said don't do, but the person that immediately came to my mind, I, I, God forgive me, it wasn't me, the person that immediately came to my mind was President Obama. Have you ever noticed that when he get, it, that speech turns into all about him? Oh, man. But no, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because the event is not about you. The focus is supposed to be on your co-worker. That's who you should talk about. Listen. God is the one who has reached out to us in love. He is the one who is the giver of every perfect and good gift. He's the one that we should be focusing on. Paul said, if you're going to boast, you better boast in the Lord. So if we're going to brag, we should brag about the greatness and goodness of God in our lives. But when pride takes hold of our life, we're robbing God of the glory that is only due Him. Paul says, pride will make you self-indulge. But I want you to listen to a second thing he says in verse 8. He says, pride will make you self-reliant. I want you to write this statement down. Your pride will lie to you. Your arrogance will lie to you. It will make you think that you are better than you really are. Your pride will make you think that you're stronger than you really are. For example, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus to the church at Laodicea, He said this. He said, Laodiceans, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Look at verse number 8. Notice what Paul says. Now you're full, now you're rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you. Listen, again, I told you before, he's speaking sarcastically. He's just making a sarcastic comment. H have you ever walked through one of those fun houses at a carnival? You go up to one of those mirrors and, and that, what those mirrors do, they give you a warped view of who you really are. You go up to one of those uh, funhouse mirrors and 
It, it'll make you look different. It'll, it, if you're skinny, it'll make you look fat. If you're fat, it'll make you look skinny. If you're tall, it'll make you look short. If you're short, it'll make you look tall. It gives you a distorted view of yourself. Listen. The same thing happens with arrogance and pride in our lives. We believe we are spiritually strong. So you know what happens? We neglect our prayer life. Amen. We think we don't need any help. And so we begin to leave God out of our everyday lives. Pride will make you self-reliant because it gives you a warped view of who you really are. Amen. Pride is a lie. It'll lie to you. But Paul says a third thing. He says pride... It's delusional. Why? Because it makes us self-centered. It makes us self-centered. Again, verse number 8. You know what pride will do? Pride will cause you to snub other people. Pride will cause you to overlook other people. Suppose you're talking with somebody. You ever talk to somebody who they're quite enamored with their own voice? You ever talk to anybody like that? I mean, I mean, they talk nonstop to the point where you get very uncomfortable. I mean, you want to leave. Uh, but you can't find an opening to say something like this. Well, I I've got to go. So as an alternative, you try all kinds of nonverbal cues. You look at your watch. You look out the window. You fidget in your chair. You start moving toward the door. You fall asleep. But nothing works. Unfortunately, the, the other person, they just remain oblivious and they keep on talking. Why is that? It's because they're so wrapped up in themselves that they don't see what's going on around them. Uh, by the way, a person wrapped up in himself makes for a very small package. Right. Amen. Arrogance and pride makes us oblivious to those around us. And when we become oblivious to other people and become so wrapped up in ourselves, you know what happens? We don't see the hurt in other people's eyes. We don't see the pain in their words. We, 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 we don't see the look of fear on their face. We don't hear their cry for help. Or we totally miss the joy that they have over some accomplishment or blessing in their life. I'll give you a prime example. Stacy, I thought about that this week as I was studying. This happens all the time in my house. I'm guilty. I know I am. See if you can identify. Somebody in my house, normally is Sadie Grace. She'll be talking. And she'll be sharing an experience that she had that day. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I have to interrupt what she's saying to talk about my day. Why is that? It's because I'm prideful. Arrogant people have a hard time seeing beyond themselves. Amen. Pride's got to be crucified in our lives. Amen. But then Paul says this about the delusion of pride. He said, pride makes us self-satisfied. Pick up reading again in verse number 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. You, we're weak, oh, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. Now listen to what he says. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the scum of the earth and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. You know what Paul's doing? He's drawing a contrast between the Corinthians and him and the apostles. The, the reality of the apostles and the attitude of the Corinthians were in stark contrast. Notice the difference here that Paul points out between the two. The Corinthians, they were exalted and satisfied and pampered. The apostles, however, were hardworking, sacrificial. They were facing abuse. The Corinthians reflected the world. The apostles, in as much as was in them, they reflected the living Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, in Scripture, the Lord clearly told those who would contemplate following Him, He told them to count the cost. Before they joined the army of the Lord, they were to count the cost of what it might mean to be a soldier in that army. You see, Jesus never promised anybody an easy road. Matter of fact, He promised that we would have tribulation. People would reject us. We would be abused. We will suffer in His name. Following Christ means to swim upstream. It, it means we'll live in a 
culture that is contrary to the Word of God. For some believers, following Christ lands them in jail. For some, it means giving their very life. Pride will make you self-indulged. Pride will make you self-reliant. Pride will make you self-centered. Pride will make you self-satisfied. But you know what Jesus Christ will do? Walking in Him, the Christ life, will make me consumed with God. It will make me Savior reliant. It will make me Savior centered. It will make me Savior satisfied. Do you know what the answer to pride is? Of course we do. It's humility. Humility, you see, has a profound sense of God's greatness. Humility shows us how small and dependent we are on God. Humility leads me to understand that I should not expect to be treated better any better than Jesus was treated. Humility leads me to be open and teachable. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to be right in every situation. Humility makes me tender hearted and sensitive to the needs of others. I share the truth of Scripture not from a superior position but from the position of service to Christ and love for the person that I'm speaking to. Humility teaches me to have a servant's heart. You know the humble person is willing to do what God wants them to do and go where God wants them to go. Amen. No matter the area of service. Right. Reminder, reminder. Let's resist the prideful thinking that leads us to believe how someone else needs this message. Yeah. Pride's delusion, but second of all, real quick, I want you to notice humility's heart. What is the heart of a humble ser servant. Now, now, now notice how Paul paints the picture of the heart of a true humble servant of God. It's found in verses 14 through 21. First of all, notice that the heart of a true humble servant of God, first of all, in verses 14 and 15, is full of love. He's full of love. Look at verse 14. I write not these things, listen, to shame you, but I write them as my beloved sons. I warn you. A humble servant's heart is full of, of love. Even though Paul's message to the Corinthians was direct, it certainly was confrontational. Most definitely it was a convictional message. There is no question though that he greatly loved them. He loved them dearly. And guess what? The most loving thing you can ever do for some people is just tell them the truth. Humbly and in love. Paul says, man, I, I think of myself almost as a spiritual father. You're, you're my beloved. Most all parents will tell you that no matter how many people they love and respect, the love that they have for their children is superior to everybody else. Amen? I mean, you love your children more than anybody else. I, I like to think that Paul spoke to them as a pastoral parent. He wasn't trying to beat them up. He was just trying to wake them up. Amen. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, we read the record of the disciples arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Here's how one Bible scholar paraphrased that in Luke chapter 9 verses 46 through 48. He said those who are truly greatest don't know and don't care. They are too busy serving others to give much thought to rank. <laughs> Listen, if we're not careful, we'll become so consumed with being right that, we really, that all we've really accomplished is coming off as, as cranky. Yeah. We can be so consumed with, with being right and winning the argument that all we do is come off as being argumentative and cranky. Hey, this world needs to hear the truth, but they need to hear it in such a way that our love for Jesus and our love for them shines through the message that we give them. Yes, amen. The heart of a humble servant is full of love, but it's also full of integrity. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech ye, be followers of me. You know what a humble servant does? A humble servant seeks to lead by example. Here Paul told the Corinthians, he said, I urge you to follow my example. He's saying, imitate me. The, 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 uh, imitate means to mimic. Paul is telling the Corinthians to follow his example. Man, that's a powerful admonition, amen? It's almost self-promoting if we didn't know who the Apostle Paul really was. 
We would think he was promoting himself. But listen, everybody in here this morning, everyone look at me, every single one of you in here this morning has somebody who looks up to you. And here's the seriousness about that. Most of the time, if they look up to us, they will follow us. They will mimic us. Children follow their parents most of the time. Our kids watch what we do. Many times they copy our vices. They'll take on our mannerisms. They respond to situations the way we have responded to situations. Many times we are embarrassed. We are horrified how our kids are behaving until we realize that they're doing nothing more than emulating us. Amen. Sunday school students follow their teachers. Students in school, a lot of times they, they have a mentor there at school as a teacher. They emulate that teacher. Listen, Paul is not saying imitate me because I'm doing a great job or because I'm a great person. He was telling them to follow his example as he followed Christ. Amen. Rather than the example of the world. Paul was encouraging the people to imitate his willingness to sacrifice, to follow Jesus, rather than to please the world. Paul was encouraging them to imitate his willingness to do whatever was necessary to effectively communicate the gospel. Paul was encouraging them to imitate his willingness to be unpopular and at times imprisoned, despised, if that's what it would, would take to remain faithful to the Lord. And then he was saying, follow my example by loving your enemies rather than pushing them away. And then, last of all, the heart of a humble servant is full of boldness. It's full of boldness. The, the servant's heart is willing to do what is difficult. Uh, look at verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up, as though I would not come unto you. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but of power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Listen, shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? Paul's rather bold, amen? Amen. Paul said he's going to send Timothy to help them. He also told them that if they didn't shape up, he was going to come to them with a greater rebuke. Do you know, sometimes the most loving thing you could ever do is just say no. Sometimes the most loving thing you could ever do is confront and rebuke. You know what? When we're guilty of, uh, of simply looking away from the sins of others, Listen, we're not being open-minded. Actually, we're being selfish. Right. We're choosing to protect ourselves from confrontation rather than caring enough to tell another per person the truth about the sin they're living in. Yes. Amen. Instead of trying to rescue the one who's drowning in sin, we turn away and we ignore their cries for help. Sometimes, if we are truly loving, we need to be willing to be the bad guy for a time. Amen. Parents, understand this. And some need to employ this. You hate to say no to your children, but many times it's the most loving and instructing thing you will ever do for them. Amen. Sometimes we need to be willing to do the hard things, even if it means they are painful to us because it's what the other person needs most. Here's how I want to close. A lot of times, a lot of times, I've been kind of transparent in the message today. I don't know that I meant to. But many times I struggle to find balance between being confident because of my relationship with Jesus and being prideful. Believing that I'm more important than I actually am. There's a tension there. Would you say amen? amen. There, there's a tension to, to find balance between being confident and being prideful. Being confident because of my relationship with Christ. But the tendency sometimes is to be prideful because we believe that we're, we're more important than we actually are. Amen. Sometimes I can come across as cranky and arrogant because I have to be right in a particular manner. I have to win every argument. I have to be correct in every situation. You know what that is? That is pride at work. Yeah. 
Listen as I close. Pride and arrogance divides churches. Pride and arrogance hinders relationships and it stifles spiritual growth. Again, I've been saying this lately because I've I've been having to do it for the last couple of months or I've been getting to do it in premarital counseling. And and I tell tell those couples, pride is is one of the top ten marriage killers. Pride is one of the top ten marriage killers. Your temper is what gets you in trouble. Everybody look at me. But it's pride that keeps you there. Pride doesn't want to say I'm sorry. Pride will do everything in its power not to admit the wrong. Pride will do everything in its power not to go to somebody and say, would you please forgive me? I'm sorry. Spiritual pride, and I quote, is not only unscriptural, it's also unspiritual and unsocial. Dr. Jerry Bynes. So to overcome pride means that we will have to surrender completely to Jesus Christ. It may mean that we have to surrender some of our attitudes, some of our actions. It may mean today we have to surrender some of our motives. It it may mean today that we have to get up out of our pew, go to somebody in this church and say, please forgive me, I'm sorry. To do that, it will take nothing less than the supernatural power of God working in our lives. Right. It's not natural to do those things. Pride comes natural. Humility is an act of God. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed.